So I'm currently in New York, and I went to the American Museum of Natural History, and I went into the People's of Africa exhibit, because it looked quite interesting, and wouldn't you know it, a bunch of the descriptions written there were clearly written by SJWs. Now, many of them were quite normal and quite neutral, like this one. The life-giving course of the Zambezi watered arid plains and facilitated navigation, giving rise to a number of states. Impressive stone ruins, such as Zimbabwe, linked with an indigenous gold mining complex founded around the 7th century, reach up the river valley to the coast. The present population, however, are relative newcomers. The Zulu state developed mostly through conquest during the great Bantu expansion south. Others, such as the Lozi, grew more gradually on a riverine farming base. All really normal. Totally, totally normal. And then we get to the political science of it, and that's fine, normally. <laughs> normally, including the political science of something, is a really useful thing for you to do. Except when you are trying to ameliorate and equivocate between these states and what we would consider to be more modern civilised states. All these states took elaborate care to maintain internal justice and guard against despotism. What do you think pre-colonial African justice looked like? Do you think it was rational? Do you think it was before a jury of their peers? Do you, do you think the warlords weren't also despots? But it, I guess it's all the white man's influence that's caused despotism in Africa. It was, it was a hub of democracy before that. In the Great Congo Basin, states and empires arose, from the coastal Congo to the Kuba, Luba, and Lunda in the very heart of Africa. Okay, states and empires arising means people getting their fucking heads cut off, and their stuff taken. But either way, they brought unity and peace, much in the same way the Roman Empire brought unity and peace, by creating a wasteland and then populating it with Romans afterwards. But they cultivated the arts and created royal courts of considerable splendour. In the 16th century, Bashongo king Shambhala, I'm not even going to try and pronounce this, was renowned as an eclectic philosopher. He doesn't have a Wikipedia page. He's not really that renowned, I guess. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure that this was a guy who was renowned as a philosopher. Wishing to rule wisely and fairly, he gathered about him representatives from all parts of his empire and encouraged the free interchange of ideas. And we will look at some of these ideas. <laughs> they're, not, they're not scientific. <laughs> Just, oh, sorry, I shouldn't laugh, I'll get to it. The river network was vital to both the economic and political expansion of these flourishing societies. I just pulled these off my phone and they're in no particular order, but this is about Egyptian women. Women in Egypt were respected and often held positions of influence. A wealthy man's wife, as mistress of his estate, helped him oversee its work. Professionally, well-born women could join a, spe join a special order of the priesthood, or serve as the temple as singers and musicians, or sacred prostitutes. They were midwives and professional mourners and dancers at funeral at funerals. Peasant women worked in the fields with men, skilled women assisted in manufacturing textiles. So they're basically like modern women now. I mean, they're, they're basically, they had loads of rights, you see. Like Egyptian women, they, they were basically progressive feminists. And I love all the use of could or did. I think maybe were forced to do these things is really the name of the game. Because in pre-industrial societies, everyone had to work. Returning to Sub-Saharan Africa, this is a list of items that were around. I didn't bother taking a photo of them, to be honest, because this was just... this was enough. Left wall, young girl's adornment. The reed necklaces are specific to uncircumcised girls. Floor, knife for circumcising girls. Wonderful. So this is what happened to women in old age. The affections developed in youth between the sexes are abruptly broken by marriage. Marriage is necessarily a compact between two groups or families rather than between individuals. The man marries a, the man a girl marries may be twice her age and a hundred miles distant from the scenes of her childhood trysts. I love that they're just they as if women in these societies is completely free. Calluses and wrinkles soon replace the clear skin of youth. The earlier abandon gives way to fear of ill health and the dangers of childbirth. Competition takes a new form. Women who were formerly rivals begin to find a new unity and gossip incessantly about their husbands. This is not done out of spite, but because gossip and the men's fear of ridicule is the women's major means of protection against abuse. It's nicely implying that all of these men would just abuse the fuck out of their wives because they can, and this is the only way they can prevent it. 
When women work at their chores in company or drink beer together, they also formulate a body of opinion that is by its very unity, that by its very unity influences the behavior of men. Women have no formal authority in Pocot life, but can exercise considerable power. So that's okay then. They've got no formal authority, but the fact that they all sit there and nag collectively means that everything's just just hunky-dory. Don't you judge this culture. And the thing is, right, normally I would say it's not really fair to judge these cultures, but it's just the way this is written with such apologetics. As if, like, say, look, no, 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 look, look, women have got loads of power in the society just because, you know, they're, they're property and you got to pay a bride price. And, no, 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 don't, don't, don't look down on these cultures. So, look, if you come from a more advanced culture than this, you can't help but look down on them because your culture is doubtless superior. I mean, hell, you know, Islamic cultures are superior to this. In the West African grasslands lie many indigenous states ranging from the tiny principalities of the Cameroon Mountains, such as the Mum, to the elaborate feudal empires of the Fulani, the Mossi, the Hausa, and the smaller but more complex societies of the Nupe and the forest states of Dahomey and Yoruba. It just strikes me as so weird that you would need to try and say that this is a good thing. Because, I mean, like, I would never try and portray feudal Europe as being some equivalent to modern day society or alternative to modern day society and i don't understand why they'd be trying to present feudal africa in the same way the fact that it's feudal is the problem no one talked up the feudal nature of europe it was seen it's generally seen as far as i'm aware as a regressive thing you know it's backwards but anyway, the Mossi and Hausa states come down from the great West African empires of the Middle Ages, such as the Ghana, Mali, Songhai, and Bornu. These were built on the Trans-Saharan gold and slave trade with the Arab peoples. The American slave trade drained much of their prosperity, and this new trade was based on the coast rather than the inland region, and today their ancient splendor has waned. How very dare they! You stole our slave trade and it made us poor. My goodness, that's so offensive. <laughs> Most of these states are Muslim. I love that Muslim as well. Ruled by emirs whose ancestors subjugated pagan peoples in a series of jihads or holy wars. Well, that's just great. That's, uh, that's just fine. And this is something... The, the, the museum is actually rather woke on jihad, but we'll get to that later. Opposition without hostility. This one's golden, right? The East African grasslands are home to diverse neighbouring peoples, some of whom hold directly opposed views about the world and how man should live in it. They nonetheless dwell side by side in relative peace. Past wars resulted from large-scale migrations that caused severe competition for land. Whoa, that's a, that's a good argument against the migrant crisis. <laughs> when Nilotic and Cushitic cattle herders pushed southwards, acute conflict arose between these immigrants and already established farmers as you would expect. In consequence, some peoples moved on, but others accepted foreign rule, and some were assimilated. But sharp opposition of values remained. The Maasai herders and Kiyaku farmers typ typify this inner conflict. They divided the land and lived apart, so they segregated themselves. Though mutual raiding became a major activity. Raiding is not a pleasant thing. A group of a band, a smallish band, will sneak into another person's territory, kill a bunch of people, steal their stuff, and run away and with, you know, captives and slaves and, you know, whatnot. Ruin people's lives, right? Far from being an act of war, however, the raid served as a safety valve, allowing each side to express its opposition and so reinforce its values without resorting to open warfare. Reinforce our values of what? Raiding you? Stealing your wives and your daughters? Murdering your sons? Taking all of your possessions? Leaving your village on fire? But hey, don't worry. It's a safety valve. We're not resorting to open warfare. This is just going to go on for generation upon generation upon generation. Everything's fine. The importance of women in African societies is usually much underrated, perhaps because women play a more quiet, private role than men. The woman rules the home and gets satisfaction from her time-consuming chores of cleaning, food preparation, and child-rearing, re for she is not taken for granted. Well, she doesn't need feminism, then, does she? She doesn't need to advance her status in life at all. Just be, <laughs> just be literally the most traditional of traditionalist wives. Among the southern Bantu, women are eagerly courted, even after marriage. 
why would that be a good thing? And maintain, and to maintain his status, a man must continually give his wife beads and ornaments so that she can make a good showing. See, it's about power. All of this is through the lens of power dynamics. And it's okay because the woman is constantly courted, so the man has to constantly work for making the woman an important thing in the world. In polygynous societies, each wife has her own household, where the husband may be little more than a guest. See, the wife owns this entire household. Yes, the husband has like five wives, but the wife has her own household. This is all totally fine and totally normal. The payment of bride wealth in no way purchases a woman, but underlines her importance and even subordinates the husband. What are you? That's that's women being treated as chattel. That's that's literally the map binder of the world like, like going on in africa and these regressive lunatics are just like oh no 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 it's fine she's not subordinate <laughs> for some reason she doesn't deserve her own husband she deserves to share one with a bunch of other people but you know she's not subordinate yeah he had to buy her but that's not the same <laughs> grants no absolute rights oh, that's, i don't imagine anyone's got many rights in this society by this system of matrilineal inheritance Many grassland societies also recognize the key role of childbearing, the female line dominating the male. Yeah, well, I suppose you'd kind of have to if you have a bunch of wives. Economic authority. You know this is going to be good, don't you? So, after the bride price has been paid, throughout Africa, women enjoy great economic prestige. Even among herders, where cattle are the nominal province of men. So, okay, women aren't allowed cattle. Never mind. Women have specific rights over cattle and their products. Most grasslands people, including herders, subsist largely on crops raised by women's hands. That sounds like they're serfs to men, doesn't it? R further, a woman's granary is inviolable. Yeah, I'm sure that, that the people doing the raids are like, you know what, we're not going to take that woman's granary. Christ, that's inviolable. And though her husband may have given her the land, she controls the crops. Well, that's fucking groovy, isn't it? You know, the husband gets to decide where she can plant the fucking things. Where a surplus can be produced or time allows for crafts like basketry or pottery, women also act as marketers and hold the family's cash wealth. Where cattle are wealth, I guess the women are shit out of luck, a number must be deposited with the family of the bride-to-be as a token of the man's good behaviour. Not with the bride, with her father. If he later defaults, his wife may leave him, and the deposit, so to speak, is non-refundable. <laughs> She's, you just can't talk about women like they're not property in this, can you? <laughs> just, I'm sorry, that's non-refundable. You didn't come and pick up your property, as in my daughter, so I'm keeping these cows. Above all, African women are proud of their strength and regard heavy labour as anything but degrading. Nor do they shun using their strengths on their husband, if need be. <laughs> yeah, I'm... I, I'm sure that they do. I'm sure that men and women in Africa are exactly equal strength. Which is why they need to sit around gossiping to make sure that their husbands don't abuse them so they can use their collective power against men. You know, because they're really strong and they don't shun using their strength on their husbands, I guess. Political authority. Except for a few tribes like the Love Do, where women rule, they seem unimportant in political life. Yet, even in the great South African kingdoms where men wield all the symbols of authority, the power behind the throne is the woman. Right, okay, see? This, this you could literally say this for any medieval European kingdom, and the feminists would sit there screeching the word patriarchy at the top of their lungs. But when it's happening in Africa... Oh, no, the, the woman is the power behind the throne, really. Blah, 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 blah. The king inherits his office only th by descent through the female line, because there are so many goddamn... <laughs> so many so polygamous marriages. <laughs> I just can't. It's the, the apologetics. And cannot transmit it. The power lies with his mother and sisters, except for the fact that the women don't have any particular importance in political life and men wield all the symbols of authority which means that they have the authority you know the purpose of having a symbol of authority but they often have their own courts and act as royal counselors among the lozy i think it is the royal title means earth directly tied to women who control the land and its fertility the king's sister nominally rules half the kingdom and his own capital is called namuso mother of government so it's basically a, a matriarchy. Though lousy women rank as legal wards of the men. <laughs> just, then, just, 
they're like children, basically, <laughs> in, the, in the eyes of the Lozi. They have explicit ways to exert power. For instance, only women can prepare the special beer required for the success of any ceremony or public event. The woman thus not only has bargaining power, but is openly recognized as vital to public life. Unlike in medieval Europe, where women had to do all these things at a men's behest, and they weren't given the symbols of authority. They, you know what I mean? It's just, it's such crazy apologetics. But don't you dare say that these women are being oppressed by their husbands, because that would be racist. Remember that Shamba something or other, the wise king who brought all of the intellectuals around his kingdom to come and discuss ideas? Well, let's have a look at some of those ideas. Many traditional African societies believe the world to be permeated with a powerful vital force. Found in stones, metal, and other inanimate or vegetable matter, it is stronger in animals and still more powerful in man. This force can be trapped and used for good or evil. What we might call magic is seen as a science, and one not to be wholly scorned. Tribal doctors know many effective medicines, but even their charms are not ineffective. They're placebos. <laughs> they offer at least the much-needed sense of security. Some charms we class as sympathetic magic. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> because they... <laughs> sympathetic bullshit, you mean. Because the object or related act resembles the desired end. Thus, rain medicine may look or sound like rain. Wow, it's amazing how that works. The <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't even get through this. Preventative medicines and charms are thought to work by virtue of their own inner force, without spiritual help, through science, not faith. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's exactly how it works. It's, it's how the medicine man controls the lightning, I guess. They believe that through uh, the magic, the black magic, you call it black magic, they call it which helps others, that you are able to send a lightning to strike someone. So can you explain that scientifically? Because it's it is something that happens every <laughs> 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 And don't forget divination. Central to almost any traditional African society is the diviner. He may also be the doctor, priest, chief, or all of them at once. Why the fuck not? All are aspects of one essential need for physical and social order. The term witch doctor is utterly unsuitable. Presumably it's offensive. The doctor, as he is better called, PhD, is there to cure. The priest may enforce the cure. Divination, however, must come first. Duh. It can be done in various ways. Often it is a show for the benefit of the public, so it's horseshit. All gossip converges on the diviner, and the compl if the complaint is a social one, like theft or adultery, he will often know the answer and divine it accordingly. So he won't actually know the answer, he'll make up the fucking answer. If it is physical, he will even call in the doctor, presumably an actual doctor, or use his own knowledge, which would be far less preferable to him calling an actual doctor. For a minor complaint, he may advise buying the appropriate fetish, which I'm sure is going to work, for protection or cure. For the more serious complaints, he will probably call in a doctor or priest. Just call the doctor. When a problem goes beyond the realm of what science can do, we enter the realm of faith. Almost all of this is built on faith. This is great. The Leopard Man Societies, the Anyota of the Bali in the Congo, typifies many of the societies of the forest belt that involve predatory animal symbol. Though invariably thought to be devoted to political murder, and I, I believe this is actually a contemporary thing they're talking about, the Anyota actually serves to unite the tribe at times of crisis. Well, it's a uniting force. It must be good. As when a chief dies and dispute over succession threatens the group unity vital to survival. Society activities then focus attention on the urgency of resolving the crisis. I mean, you'd think they'd do it through lot or maybe by democratic vote or something. F far from being criminals, initiates are wholly respectable. When crisis occurs, they may identify with their chosen symbol, the leopard, also the symbol of death. The trance identification enables the initiates to communicate with the dead ancestors. I love the way they're saying this like this is factually true. Seeking advice and help. During these trances, which occur spontaneously in response to tribal crises, luck just spontaneously happen. There's no political murder. Oh, no, there is. Of course there is. This is horseshit, right? So, the leopard men do indeed behave like leopards, pouncing on their victims, killing and partly eating them. The killings are not acts of wanton murder, however, but more like ritual sacrifices. Explain to me the difference. 
Designed to avert disaster for the group. Yeah, but if we kill a bunch of people, we won't have a disaster. Just, just genius. Absolutely amazing. I don't know why we don't do this in the modern day. What What's the point of courts and justice and judges and jails? We could just ritually murder and eat each other. <laughs> just... The horror they inspire sharpens awareness of whatever malady activated the Anyota. So bring on the killings. <laughs> like, like these people don't have any responsibility for their own actions. Conflict among people is soon resolved and the cause of the evil righted so that the dread killings will cease. Yeah, I fucking bet. In, in trance, the initiates are utterly unaware of what they're doing. Yeah, I'm sure that's what they tell you. So the killings are random and a man may even unknowingly kill his own kin. This adds to the horror and to the effectiveness of the society as a deterrent. Yeah, so that's that's basically something we can respect. We can look at that and go, that's basically the same as Western justice, if not in some way superior, because it probably costs a lot less and it probably happens a lot quicker. This is another amazing one. The sacred state. The great states of the Western woodlands often appear to be despotic. <laughs> I thought they were preventing despotism. We saw earlier that they were definitely preventing despotism. Only with the coming of firearms, however, could a ruler really exercise any personal power to subdue the will of the people. It's not that one guy has a gun, you dummies. Kings ruled by virtue of their descent from semi-divine ancestors and were often considered merely a receptacle for that divine power. A king's weakness or abuse of his position was seen as a sign of unfitness and he was promptly removed. Still, as opposed to more classical divine kingdoms, the sacred states were often militaristic and were built of smaller kingdoms seeking common defence. Such confederations were quickly welded into single unified nations by creating the myth of an ancestor common to all. I love the way they say this like someone had the idea of doing this. Like it's a top-down project. Like this isn't just a legend that ends up sort of, you know, swirling around and get, being passed around and then builds into the identity. But anyway... Whereas each had seen itself as a separate family entity, the very notion of family enabled them to extend or contract their horizons to suit conditions. The unity achieved in this way was both secular and sacred. Secular and sacred. Was it? It sounds like absolute horseshit, especially when we go into the bit where literally every aspect of their existence was religious. Totems. Like heraldry in Europe, widespread totemic symbolism serves in Africa to distinguish peoples by descent and relative status. Some nations have animal totems, like the Lion of Dahomey. The Barga Snake and the Senfu Hornbill are central to the religious identity of those people. See? Just, it, it's all religious. Such symbols are repeated not only in shrines or on sacred, sacred figurines and masks, but on state regalia and even on household furniture and utensils. Lesser totems for clans and lineages enable people to determine quickly a stranger's relationship and the proper level of respect and hospitality due. Because if you're not the right totem, you can get fucked. Legends often link totemic animals with a founding ancestor. Out of respect, they are not hunted, killed, or eaten by any member of the totemic group. Among other things, totemism helps to unite disparate people by the bond of common sentiment. The stool. Of all the authority symbols, none outranks the stool. For the Ashanti, the stool contains the kra, or the soul of its departed owner. The famous golden stool is, in effect, the soul of the nation, ruling through the body of the temporal king. Representing the ancestors, the king himself is semi-divine. He must always wear slippers, lest his feet be polluted by the dead buried under the soil. Remember, the state is also secular, in as well as being sacred. His health must be kept perfect, for it is the health of the nation. To ensure ge democratic government, yeah, I'm sure all of these are democratic governments, completely, completely democratic. Tradition obliges him to delegate much authority to other officials or stools. Secret societies such as the Ogboni of the Uromba also see that the local government serves the people's interests. See, it's it's not like a hierarchy that's exploitative or anything. No, 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 no. No, no, this is serving the interests of the people. Not the women who are the property of the husbands. No, 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 shut up. The Ogboni can advise or even countermand the king, and can demand or enforce his death, usually by suicide, if, he's, if he abuses his sacred position that's also secular. Concern with ancestors dominates the political scene as yet another check on the abuse of personal power in the great sacred states. If kingly descent is passed on in the female line, as in much of West Africa, only the children of the king's sisters, not his own, can inherit his status. His sister is then, in a sense, in a sense more important than he. 
for she holds the continuity of the royal line. In a sense, she's more important. As in, after he's dead. And until her son or daughter is, you know, whatever. But she's not really more important, is she? Royal women often have their own courts and their own stools of authority, and their word carries much weight in state affairs. Yet their power too derives from the ancestral fount of all authority. Along with many of their onerous duty, duties, shared with the men of the royal clan is ritual propitiation of the ancestors, a constant reminder that both rulers, uh, to both rulers and ruled, there are divine powers greater than those of the king. But remember, this is also a secular society. But you know, what I, you know, what I find interesting is the way they tried to jam the idea that these societies are formed in a secular way together with the religious bit. They understand that secularism is a much more preferable thing to a theocracy, and yet they can't help but describe this as a a primitive tribal theocracy because that's literally what it is. The spirit world, focus for religious life in traditional Africa, explained the world of the living and offered hope, encouragement, and the promise of an afterlife, affirming a power greater than man's. While many systems embraced a creator god, few believed him to be directly approachable, but spirits, approachable in varying degree, bridge the gap between the living and the creator. An animal spirit can convey some of its power, whether cunning, strength, speed, or ferocity, and was to be respected but used, not worshipped. Worship was only for ancestral spirits, often represented by figurines and masks, or by vacant throne or stool wherein dwelt the, the people's founding ancestor. By veneration of the spirits, all-knowing, all-powerful, and by following the ancestral way, the, uh, the good are assured afterlife. See, the, I don't... Sorry, you can probably hear cars beeping in the background because I'm in a fucking hotel room. See, the, this isn't like... It's not bad. It's not wrong that they're like this, right? But it's in no way to be considered to be the equal of other societies around the world. You know, th this is incredibly primitive, incredibly ancient. I mean, if you went back like two or three thousand years in Europe, you'd get the same thing. It's just that life has progressed in, and not just Europe, obviously, Jesus Christ, you know, literally anywhere in the world. You know, religions have, have passed on, and it, even then, right, it's just it's to do with the environment these people have found, find themselves in. They find themselves in low population density and, believe it or not, often resource scarce. We sit there and think, well, Africa's a rich continent full of resources. Yeah, when you have a strip mine, yeah, it is. But when you're a guy with a wooden club, no, it's not. The Sacred Societies of the Yoruba The Yoruba of Nigeria have a number of cults and societies, sacred rather than secret. Though membership and ritual details are not always publicly known, there is an awareness of their existence and many play a vital role in making government effective. This sounds democratic. The powerful Ogboni society, adapting to modern conditions, again this is happening right now, upholds contemporary local government. <laughs> Other cults such as El Gaba, Shango and Oshun unite diverse groups in common beliefs that help strengthen the governmental and moral system. I'm sure the governmental and moral system is the equivalent of anything you'd find elsewhere in the world. Just, just it's, it's all the same. They're all governmental and moral systems. They must all be the same. The very existence of the cults checks the power of political rulers, for it signifies a spiritual power greater than theirs, and a cult member may feel lo more loyalty to his cult than his king. Brilliant. That's fucking brilliant. The governmental system is dominated, controlled, and manipulated by cultists. That's just... That is so democratic. So progressive. The king may have power, but it is an empty power unless reinforced by the highest spiritual authority of such societies. Completely unaccountable. Brilliant. I, I, I'm just... Oh, th why do they keep trying to portray this in such a positive light? These are terrible things that we would never tolerate. Sacred societies have varied functions, supporting moral, economic, and political welfare. Membership comes only through initiation, limited to those considered fit. The initiations vary, some testing and fortifying moral character. I, I imagine the moral character of these people is incredibly high. Others developing stronger political abilities. Masks and figures serve, serving as society, society emblems help to keep attention focused on the ultimate spiritual authority to which all men owe allegiance. Again, just not, not that it's the belief of theirs, it's just the fact of it. The act of initiation places members directly under the power of the spirits and first in line to be stricken with disaster should they transgress the tribal law. Initiation also helps bind people together who, separated by residence or occupation, might feel no common ties. 
Those particularly in, those initiated together become blood brothers with particularly strong mutual obligations. It's almost like religion has a purpose in society. And you know, I'm 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 an atheist and I'm pretty anti-theist as well. But I can accept that there is a purpose in primitive societies for religions. It's interesting how we'll get to which are the good religions and the bad religions. Spoiler alert, Christianity is among the bad religions. So most society initiations in the Congo, such as that of the Pende boys, are rites of passage, making the child into an adult and placing him under strong sanctions that bolster his behaviour as a responsible moral person in the Congo. <laughs> Some societies, like the Bwame of the Rega in the East, involve elaborate hierarchy of grades, each with specific duties and authority and its own ivory emblem. Among the barley of the Aturi forest, this actually is interesting, don't get me wrong. There, there exists the renowned Anyatola Leopard Man Society. The leopard also symbolizes the spiritual power for which many other peoples who denote, cult, who denote cult membership with charms of leopard skins or teeth by cutting leopard claw marks into their skin. Membership in such societies is a high honor. Like the leopard, members must be strong and relentless, but only in the pursuit of justice. They are guardians of the social order. You know, right before they go into that trance and start murdering friends, family, and randoms alike. But it's just to keep you in line. They don't know what they're doing. You know, it's, it's until the crisis is over. It's not political murders. Shut up. Stop thinking about it too hard. The Congo Initiation. Every three years, the Nukumbi ceremony of the Bira advances boys into adulthood, uniting them in age groups. Initiation takes place deep in the forest where, according to belief, malign spirits wait to devour the boys should they transgress. Soon after the priest circumcises them, the boys must lie on rough beds that will be their only shelter for months to come. Dressed to frighten the boys and scare off any curious non-initiates, the priest represents the tribal spirits, the leopard and the mythical bird. The boys gain strength and courage and are taught a number of sacred dances that, that graphically symbolise the tribal law which they will thenceforth live. The initiates learn, above all, that the sacred way of the fathers and are placed directly under the power of their ancestors who enforce the law by threat of sickness or death. The initiator wears a skin mask with a gannet skin adornment, raffia armbands to represent a mythical bird, ankle rattle to drive away evil spirits, good thing he's got that, he is painted with spots to symbolize the sacred leopard and carries the base stick of a set of seven or eight makata, a portable xylophone that is used only at initiations. The whips, coiled to prove they have been used, are to strengthen the boys, so they whip them. The banana is used to set the catechism in motion. As long as it moves, the boys must sing. The basket contains the severed foreskins, the leaves in which the wounds are wrapped, and the blood collected, all of which is hid hidden to rot in the forest when the initiation is over. The extra armbands hanging from the roof belong to a second initiator who assists when numbers are large. How progressive. And this is the thing. There are literally people trapped in this in the modern day and age. I mean, these aren't... And this is the thing that really annoys me, right? The way the progressives talk about these people as if they're not really human. What they are is a kind of subspecies of animal. They're, they're just like, no, no, this is what they do. You leave them alone. They, they, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna cut their foreskins off. They're gonna. I mean, how we do that now? But like, imagine how, imagine how it's done. Imagine the the, the tools they're using to do it. But then, then you know, they, they're gonna, they're gonna go on to believe that the tribal spirits of leopards, blah 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 blah. It's like, look, none of this is real. None of this is real. It's all nonsense in their heads. Do we not have some kind of responsibility to inform them, look, all of this is backwards and nonsense, and there is actually a big wide world full of loads of interesting things and technology and, and stuff. Should we not at least tell them that this is an option? The Quelly have adapted to the forest while retaining their former identity as cultivators. They hunt, fish, forage, and make maximal use of the forest to enhance their material comfort. See, if they're looking to enhance the material comfort, can't we help them out in that way? Maintaining little contact with nearby indigenous hunters. Besides peanuts and peppers, they cultivate both manoic and plantains, the two best non-seasonal crops for forest planting. It was the introduction of these staples that led to the rapid expansion of the forest bantu. The work of cutting and clearing, while arduous, does not call for large-scale cooperation, and like most for forest farmers, the quelle divide into autonomous villages. I love the way they, the, the autonomous villages, you mean they're just separate tiny tribes. Using a term like autonomous implies that there is some sort of greater political awareness going on here, 
and I really would be surprised if that's true. Anyway, their social system suits the mobility needed by people forced to move their fields every year or two, and their material culture further reflects the practical approach to life. Not class conscious, the quale no, nonetheless have their own standards of prestige. I love that they put that in there. Not class conscious. That's, that's the term of a Marxist. Marxists use that term. Class consciousness. This was written by a fucking communist. I mean, literally, why would you need to put that in there if you weren't yourself class conscious? That's the sort of thing a Marxist is looking out for. Not the sort of thing that the average person reading this is going to really think, well, what the, you know, what, what did that tell me about the Quelle? Not much. Tell me more about the person who wrote it than about this tribe. So you can't really see this because of the strands across it, but I was reading it at the time so I can fill in the details. So carrying dolls on their back cloths, these girls learn how to carry children, as with other things such as indigenous toys which gently rotate set animals or human figurines in motion there's often symbolic significance to be learned a boy learns how to make a bone arrow to hunt by digging holes in the earth an imitation of his favorite of the favorite am adult gambling game children gain visual and manual ability yeah but what do the non-binary ones do what's that there aren't any non-binary ones there is literally not one fucking mention of a gender in this whole thing that isn't either male or female boy or girl Oh, that's really weird. It's almost like this non-binary LGBT trans crap is a product of first world societies. Anyway, let's carry on. The introduction of ironworking and advances in agriculture in the early centuries AD laid the basis for the growth of highly organized kingdoms and city-states rivaling those of medieval Europe. Because literally, that's what all of this is about. It's about saying, look, Africa is basically the same as medieval Europe. It's basically as advanced. It's all essentially the same. Stop saying that Africa's a primitive and savage place, even though Africa appears to be a primitive and savage place. And I just want to stress, not all of Africa, not all, but still large amounts of area, large amounts of people are actually still trapped in this not even medieval <laughs> existence. And, and they're like, oh, don't be a cultural imperialist. No, I think it might be good for them. I'm sure that the pe people living in Nigeria or wherever, you know, in a, in a major city that does international trade, that has all the, com the comforts of modern life, are sat there thinking, thank fuck for colonialism. I don't want to be stuck in a bush somewhere with a witch doctor telling me about what the ancestors think. The Senegambians. The desert's western fringes trail off through a savanna that in places turns into forest, but elsewhere reaches almost to the sea. The Senegambians live just above the forested yam belt, and root crops give way to cereal and rice cultivation, with sorghum the main crop. The advent of Islam, the advent of Islam, just the advent, it just sprung up. Oh no, wait, it was brought by the sword by a bunch of conquering Arabs, right? Political, brought political unity not previously known in the area. Yeah, I bet it fucking did. Under the caliphate. Also, but they, you know, it's just it's just presented as if it was a neutral thing. They were like, hey, here's some Islam. Would you like to be politically unified? And they're like, yeah, that sounds great. And not one person has to die. And also a more complex social hierarchy with certain occupations such as smithing, leatherworking, confined to restricted castes. Brilliant. It's a caste system. Dress reflects this awareness of status. For instance, women wear various seasonal and wool headdresses according to their age and marital status. Jewelry also denotes rank, denotes rank and status among both men and women. Yes, they have a section called the Power of Islam. They don't have one called the Power of Christianity or the Power of Judaism or the Power of any... No, no, the Power of Islam. Because, like I said, these guys, they absolutely love Islam. But no, 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 don't sugarcoat it to, be, to, to their credit. At least, except in the part that we just saw. Jihad, the Holy War. When Islam swept across North Africa in the 7th century, jihad was considered a sacred duty. It was religious fervor that helped push holy wars not only up into Europe, but right along the West African coast. North Africa long remained a religious battleground. Relics of the Crusades still found testify to the threat posed to Europe in the Middle Ages. After the initial religious zeal subsided, though, the basis of Islamic expansion changed from war to trade. What, because they'd conquered everything of value? Of course. Oh, actually, no, because sometimes they got defeated as well. Anyway, 
Trade is still proselytized, but the news African Muslim converts retained many traditional customs and belief that, for instance, did not relegate women to the inferior status accorded to them by some Orthodox Muslims. Well, that's funny because it sounds like they already had inferior status. Are you saying that Islam put them at an even lower status than being the property of the men? The ultimate power of Islam still lies in its adaptability. The lack of internal schism... The, the lack of internal schism in Islam. They, they literally have this. They don't ask, what's a Sunni? What's a Shia? What's a Deobandi? What's a, you know, they, they don't have all of... I mean, the idea that Islam doesn't have internal schisms is fucking amazing to me. It had internal schisms right from the death of Muhammad. You fucking liars. Anyway, in the sense of superiority it instills in its converts, yes, Muslims are fucking supremacists for Muslims. Wow, I mean, that is actually quite woke, really. Apart from the papering over the internal schisms, it is surprisingly woke. The spread of Islam brought not only the Islamic religion, but new political, social, and economic ideas. Yeah, it's called colonialism. That's what that is. Colonialism. And in reverse, led to a flow of African influences beyond the continent. Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia harbour relics of a cult using crocodile scabbards for ritual swords and knives, clearly related to Persia, where ritual clubs similarly involved the crocodile, crocodile cult. African influences reaches to Spain, just as Spanish influences abound in Africa. Islam's austerity has even influenced the nature of jewellery in West Africa, yet yeah, austerity, you could call it conservatism, but that would make them sound like Christian right-wingers, and we don't want people to think that Islam is fucking conservative or anything. Anyway... The nature of jewellery in West Africa, yet their charms made of Quran verses mingle easily with more traditional African charms. Are you fucking serious? Are you say are the Muslims say, yeah, I know you're kind of pagan polytheists who worship spirits, but that's okay, actually. We, 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 yeah, we're, we're obsessively devoted to the one monotheistic God, and we literally can't paint pictures of our prophet because that might be idolatry. But your your traditional African tribal charms of yeah that's fine it's just it's just fine no one complains. Vast distances were covered by Islamic traders. Major ivory trading route through the Congo stretched from coast to coast, and the east coast has long been influenced by Islam and the Arab culture. Oh, how was it influenced? Oh, what's that? Millions of slaves taken, castrated, and then sold in in Arabia. Right? Okay, it, it was just influenced. It just it, it's actually good cultural exchange. Among the changes brought to African societies by Islam, such as political and religious unification, came a system of formal education and with it, a new concept of status. Education in Quranic schools, oh right, so indoctrination. Theocratic indoctrination is what you mean. Not, not just, okay, fine, whatever. Though open to all became a means for some to climb higher than others. Oh, so indoctrination into a hierarchy of privilege. Gotcha. In some cases, it meant an almost complete break with the past. Yes, I bet it fucking did. Oh, my ancestors, your ancestors, shut up. Allah, that's it. Or cut your head off. <laughs> but the strength of the past survives in certain traditional, certain traditional forms, such as skin water bottles or pow, pow, wooden powder horns and flasks translated to, to the elaborate painted pottery vessels, so just stuff. Not their, not their ideas, not their beliefs, not their... Not their religion, just stuff. When Islam spread to West Africa, it gave rise to Africa's most ancient university. The great trading center of Timbuktu in the state of Songhai became a center of learning so famed that scholars came from all over the Islamic world to discourse con together and consult its priceless library. Well, that makes the genocide of these people just fine then, doesn't it? That makes the absolute conquest of them just fine. Colonialism? Certainly not such a bad thing. Look at this library we've got. The Berber inhabitants of North Africa strongly resisted the Arab invaders. Why would they do that? The Arabs bring peace and light. But eventually fled to the less hospitable mountain and desert areas, where they could freely continue their own way of life. Adoption of Islam was often a best nominal. To achieve political unity needed for defence against further Arab attacks, the Ait Atta elected a military chief each year. Well, that's amazing, isn't it? Consider how peaceful Islam is that they needed to do this. Even the local government involved a complex division of the territory in segments and successfully avoided any hierarchical system. I, I love this. And successfully avoided any hierarchical system. As if hierarchies are bad. 
I mean, we've sat there explaining how Africa is, in fact, a largely hierarchical society with caste systems. They're basically feudal, but these guys, oh, they they, they avoided hierarchy. What's, what's the problem with hierarchy? Well, it means that some people are on top and some people at the bottom, and yeah, it makes societies grow great, but, uh, you know, it would be better if we're all in a bush somewhere, wouldn't it? Fucking successfully avoided any hierarchical system. Just get fucked. Ait Atta have remained remarkably unconcerned with status, not even veiling their women when visiting Arab towns. Wow, how progressive. No, wait, that's regressive. That's too liberal. Fuck the liberals. Primarily nomadic herders, they do some mountain farming. Compared with others more acculturated to the Arab way, Ait Atta life is hard and frugal, but they find it ample because it is their own. Oh, yeah, they would never want anything more than what they have. Good, good for them. Maybe they should just continue on like this for another 10,000 years. And here we get to the fuck Christianity bit. Everywhere, one of religion's main functions is to bind people with the ties of common sentiment or belief. The two major foreign influences Africa were, of course, Christianity and Islam. Although much, <laughs> such evidence of the existence of multi-headed deities and certain common religious symbols suggests possible Hindu influence. Yeah, I, I'm sure they couldn't have created a multi-headed deity on their own. Islam brought not only spiritual unity, but a political unity. Yes, it's, it subjugated them via a colonial empire, a colonial theocratic empire. But, I mean, you know, it's unity, isn't it? Unity's a good thing, isn't it? Oh, no, wait, I thought diversity was a good thing. Shit. Shit. This is like a monoculture. Shit. It's going against the narrative. But <laughs> First enforced, but then maintained by the very strength and unity of the religious belief itself. Wow. So... It was first enforced with an iron fist until it became sufficiently indoctrinated into the conquered people and then they would internalize this oppression and maintain it themselves. Amazing. Christianity, though, because less unified and much more in conflict with traditional African values, are you fucking shitting me? I mean, don't get me wrong. The Abrahamic religions universally are in complete conflict with African values, obviously being monotheistic but i mean at least christianity at least, like the catholics they'd be like yeah we've got three gods in one we're slightly more pagan than the other ones we're slightly more polytheistic than the other ones but no no christianity is much less unified nah, less unified you mean it was imposed on them less harshly with less <laughs> less to do with chopping people's heads off and more to do with persuasion was it proselytization and it had a largely disruptive influence, socially and politically. It's just bad. Christianity is just bad. Islam good, though. Islam good. The African countered by making, these, <laughs> making of these new religions something of his own. And this genius for selective adaptation is now bringing forth distinctive and new vital, uh, vital beliefs in Africa. Didn't with Islam, though. Kind of got subjugated. Political influences. The political aspect of foreign influence in Africa has been far more disruptive than the economic aspect, but, and without similar resulting benefits. It has generally been, remar generally been marked by domination and often enslavement or forcible subjugation. Yes, mostly by Muslims for most of the history of Africa since we know about it. The imposition of foreign rule created political entities much wider than existed before, and this might have set, been advantageous, but the same powers that set up these unities failed, usually to consolidate them. They existed largely on paper alone. The common sentiment that must underlie any truly unified nation was lacking. I, what I love about this is what they're saying is w the West didn't colonize them hard enough. If we'd colonized them as, as firmly as the Muslims and had co kept them under our un religiously under our thumb with an iron fist to the point where they were sufficiently indoctrinated and would impose it on each other, then they would they'd be like, well, yeah, I mean, it brought unity. It, it didn't disrupt in the same way Christianity did. <laughs> but any truly unified, un truly unified nation was lacking with the removal of foreign military forces. Force the imposed unity tended to crumble. The new political entities being built, often with difficulty and certainly less vast, are stronger in their roots, lie in a common sentiment that is African, not foreign. Even though we were just saying how great foreign influences were, especially when done by Islam, which really was a unifier, not a diversifier. But, I mean, you know, when Christianity diversifies people, that's a bad thing. Shut up. Don't think about it. Africa and slavery. Much of what's loosely termed slavery in Africa was, in fact, serfdom a much more humane institution and primarily a way of dealing sensibly with war captives and criminals. Holy fucking shit. I thought the Portuguese stole the slave trade from the Arabs. I'm so sorry that we ruined their economies by taking the slaves instead of sending them across East Africa. 
just but now now it's not even slavery oh no no it's basically serfdom yeah it's just humane it was sensible uh, yeah shut up don't think about it they, they were put to work and gradually could secure for themselves and their descendants a full and honorable place in society fuck you in no society in all of human history has being an emancipated slave made you a full and honorable place in society no fucking way even after Arab and European slave traders introduced real slavery. Oh yeah, it wasn't real slavery until we got there. <laughs> the Arabs got there. Many African rulers at first treated their slaves with respect. Fucking people treat... Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, they were just like, oh, I know you're a slave, but what was your first name? <laughs> like, get fucked. Get fucked. But the coastal slave trade soon spread, spread corruption and greed. That's right. The Europeans spread corruption and greed. I mean, we didn't... We didn't, uh, we didn't come in and find ourselves with a huge and established slave trading network already. No, we're the ones who essentially made that happen. Shut up. And thousands of Africans were caught and sold into a form of slavery that, as practiced in the New World, outdid anything ever known in Africa. Oh, I'm fucking sure. I am absolutely certain. The slaves, however, of those few who survived, brought with them something of Africa. If, look, if it was only a few that survived, it wouldn't have been a profitable endeavor. Most of them did survive, but don't get me wrong, it, the slave ships were fucking awful. I'm not in any way trying to ameliorate the fucking horror of this. But the, uh, what I'm annoyed about is they're trying to ameliorate the horror of actually being a slave in Africa. I mean, look at the... Look at the continent that the Europeans discovered and started taking slaves from. And tell me, did those people, do you think those people were like, yeah, you know what, slaves deserve rights too. But anyway, the slaves, however, the few that survived, brought them something of Africa. A something that enabled them to survive the psychological horrors following the physical horror of the mi Middle Passage. Thus, the Af African tradition was exported to the Americas. Slavery in South America. Unlike the slaves exported to North America, those sent to South America were often kept together in tribal groups. Yeah, I'm sure the Portuguese were just hunky-dory to their slaves. Just as the policy in, North, in the North was to prevent unified uprisings, uprisings by destroying traditional bonds, forcing the slaves to pe speak English as the only common language, so in South America maintaining tribal divisions and actively fostering tribal hostilities thwarted united insurrection. Great. Pitting them against one another. It, that's somehow better, is it? That's somehow better than just forcing them all to speak a common language. In some area, <laughs> areas, owners even sponsored annual festivals, during which each tribal group was expected to demonstrate its superiority in activities such as dance or music. However questionable this motive, the result was that even today, certain very specific African cultures still thrive on the southern continent. Just because the Portuguese were the largest slave-trading European nation in all of history, as in tra traveled the most slaves from Africa to the New World, profited the most, had the most die, and I'm, sh I'm sure that they weren't anything like the Spanish when it came to their treatment of natives and non-white people. I mean, you know, the Spanish were absolutely savages. I'm sure the Portuguese were just, just absolute peaches. And we finally get to slavery in North America, and you fucking know this is going to be considered the absolute worst kind of slavery in all of human history. I mean, the Arabs used to cut their fucking balls off, but this is somehow worse. So, in view of the unquestionable horror suffered by people uprooted and deprived of their very humanity, which is literally what happened with every other slave trading group ever in all of human history from Africa... I mean, they literally all did this before the Europeans got... But it's okay. It's, it's worse here, right? This picture of a Carolina slave wedding makes us think about the ways slaves coped with the terrible adversity of their lives. Beneath a facade of gaiety and outward, outward compliance, or complacence, sorry, towards slave owners were a deep despair and bitterness that cannot be minimized and that form a part of the legacy of being African-American today. This is how... The, this, is, this is what the, the, the terrible thing they're doing to black people in America. Right? They are saying, look, you can't not be part slave. That's what they're doing. In the other groups, don't worry, not so bad. It's all right, don't worry about it. But you, you, you have a deep... I mean, they, they, they might look happy in these pictures, but they're not. They're really unhappy. This is, this is evil and awful and way worse than anything else that ever happened, even though it doesn't seem worse just from the pictures, but shut up, don't think about it. You need to remember that you're a slave, not the other black people in the world. I mean, we're not going to remind them of it all the time, but you. 
The objects shown here were all of the Yoruba people of Nigeria and matched closely to the objects included in the picture. Unbeknownst to their own... How, how is that possible if they suppress their culture? Unbeknownst to the owners, many slaves maintained the essence of their culture. What do you mean, unbeknownst? How, what, all this pottery. How is this... Uh, anyway, shut up. We, we cannot forget the horrors of slavery. Because otherwise, it might allow pe black people to just get on with their fucking lives. It helps to remember how African traditions continue to enrich American life today. Again, I thought you said they fucking destroyed these. Within the depths of misery experienced by slaves, many people nevertheless managed to find, the strength in, find strength in aspects of African culture that could not be taken away from them. Although the practice of separating families that meant that no one African tradition was transplanted intact in North America, many elements of African culture persisted. These included a strong respect for family ties. This is, this is a leftist that's written this. A strong respect for family ties. This, this this feminist, undoubtedly, who would have been like, yeah, 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 women's emancipation, great, don't get married, fuck man. Strong respect for family ties, though. It's okay when it's black people doing it. Many religious beliefs, but not Christianity, because that sucks. Islam's pretty good, though. Technical Technological knowledge in the fields of metallurgy, medicine, and agriculture, textile manufacture, basketry, and pottery making, brilliant. I mean, that's uh, pretty rare, uh, except for all of humanity outside of Africa. Because so much knowledge was preserved, even in the context of the brutal slave era, much in American literature, the visual arts, dance, and music has strong African roots. Literally, everything but the Western, Northern Europeans is okay. Pretty excusable. We don't need to condemn it. But holy shit, when it comes to us, you better believe. You better fucking believe. We are the absolute unquestionable worst people on earth so i hope you enjoyed this quick trip around the american museum of natural history it was uh very good very enlightening very progressive uh <laughs> it's okay for africa to be trapped in the backwards hellhole because they believe crazy things and you have to understand believing crazy things means you think these things are literally true whether they're not literally true or not so don't even think about trying to take their beliefs away from them because that would be colonialism but it's okay when the muslims do it so shush and <laughs> Islam, powerful, unifying force. Yeah, kind of genocidal, kind of theocratic, kind of kind of monstrous in almost every way that you can conceive of. Eradicated cultures left, right, and centre, but that's not nearly as bad as when we do it, even though we didn't do it nearly as efficiently, and we actually brought diversity to Africa through the fractious nature of Christianity. Blah, 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 blah. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Western's bad. Africa good. <laughs>